So Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, Big Bear, Little Bear. As you know, Ursa Minor with Polaris, which is uh, the closest to the terrestrial North Pole that we see. So all the other constellations rotate around it in the Northern Hemisphere. It is actually an F71 star, highly, highly luminous. Uh, Polaris has transitioned off the main sequence. It is in a very, um, very, very erratic variable stage right now as it transitions into its next stage of stellar evolution. And um, Ursa Major, all the, it, it, it's a bright star. Mizar is actually a double star, Mizar and Alcor, but it's actually Mizar is two binary pair, is one binary pair, Alcor is two binary pair. So that's really a six star system of stars that you're looking at when you uh, look at Mizar and Alcor together. They're all main sequence stars. And so, as you can see, Mizar and Alcor are still in the main sequence, um, but they, and they're not very, very bright or luminous, but Ursa Minor is well on its way to transitioning across the diagram to its final end products as it is uh, uh, it's a variable star at the moment. So uh, this is in a really interesting galaxy, GN. Z11. GN stands for Goods North. That's the name of, of that particular survey that was done by Hubble. It's part of their Candles legacy survey of galaxies going back in time as far as possible. As you know, eventually the JWST telescope will go up and hopefully take us further back into the past, into this nebulous re region between the Dark Ages and the reionization area where stars and galaxies first began to form. However, uh, the galaxy GNZ11, uh, and the Z11 is the redshift number 11. So right here where we are, there's zero redshift. The further back you go in time, the further redshift did the spectrum are from galaxies according to Hubble's law, which is not on your uh, a major focus this year for Science Olympiad, though some people may choose to have a question or two about it. Um, they're all different. So this particular galaxy uh, is the oldest, furthest away, well, oldest according from us here. Actually, it's quite young because it just came into existence not too awfully long ago, astronomically speaking again. Uh, but it has been measured spectroscopically by Hubble to be 13.3 billion, 13.3 uh, uh, or 3 billion years away, and the universe only came into existence 14.7 billion years ago. So this is the furthest back that we have seen a galaxy, um, and the interesting part about this galaxy is it's 1% of the Milky Way galaxy, which may not sound like very much, only 1% of the Milky Way galaxy, but the Milky Way galaxy is pretty darn big. So it's a puzzle as to how this galaxy could get farm this many stars and get this big uh, so early on in the universe because it's formed stars 20 times faster than the Milky Way did. So uh, Ursa Major also contains the Pinwheel Galaxy um, and it is thought that it, it must have had an encounter with a pre, with a galaxy, gal, other galaxy at some point in time, because its spiral arms are just chock a block full of massive stars that have been fairly recently formed. Uh, you can see what it looks like in X-ray, Galax, in ultraviolet, optical by Hubble, and infrared by Spitzer, and the up top image is a composite. You can see all the pink star formation regions. You can see all the massive blue giant stars along the edges of those spiral arms that have formed. Uh, Virgo uh, has Spica for a star. Spica is um, a two-star system, and 
the two the two stars are close enough together that they're highly distorted distorted in the direction of each other, gravitationally pulling each other out of the spherical shape. And remember that there are so many different star constellation charts, uh, very different kinds, uh, and you need to be able to locate the constellations and the stars in a whole different variety of constellation charts. Um, again, um, just a caveat to let you know, part one, remember, is uh, on constellation star in DSO ID. So within Virgo, we have two galaxies, M60 and M104 are two of the largest galaxies within the Virgo cluster. The M60 is a very large elliptical uh, galaxy that is kind of has random older stars kind of swimming around in it. It has no structure uh, per se. However, uh, embedded within that galaxy is a subcompact dwarf galaxy. And it is thought that this sub, because Chandra has imaged a, a very bright x ray source in the center of it, which could possibly be a supermassive black hole. But what's a supermassive black hole doing in the center of a little subcompact dwarf galaxy? It is thought that there have been a lot of interactions over time with other galaxies and that they have stripped all the material away from this little subcompact um, gal dwarf galaxy. And, and, it, so, and that's why it has that black hole in the center. And this might be how that particular morphology of a galaxy evolves. And the other uh, galaxy is M104, the Sombrero Galaxy. Again, a beautiful spiral galaxy, but now we can see it nearly edge on. So we have a better idea of the halo, the bulge in the center. And you can see that there is star formation going on in some of those um, spiral arms of, of that galaxy. So part two, um, subsection I, again, a general knowledge of stellar evolution as stars evolve over time. Again, understanding how, how the main, how the, those stars are, so, are associated with, with the HR diagram, where they fit on it, what it tells about them. Uh, we've talked a little bit about as the stars transition from one, one branch to another, they become very irregular, very unstable, they become a variable star, and those, those regions are called instability regions, instability strips. Uh, that is not a main focus of, of the content for 2020. It might be, um, asked at maybe the national level, which, goes sometimes a little tiny bit beyond uh, the event description, but nothing that is not implied within the event description. Stellar classification of stars, as you know, stars are classified by their spectra. Spectra are very complicated, which is why they, you can see here the sun, uh, Arcturus, which is a red supergiant, Procyon, which is um, a very cool star, uh, compared to Arcturus, they all look sort of pretty much alike. So they put together the little comic book barcode uh, that shows just the major lines associated with each one of those different temperatures to give you an idea of the spectral differences. There is an activity and investigation on identifying uh, spectra and classifying spectra doing it yourself, um, that's in the CD-ROM coach's manual, and it is also, oh, I don't think we ever posted that one on the Chandra website. No, we did not. Uh, so it is, that particular investigation and activity is on the uh, astronomy coach's manual, which you can get from the NSL bookstore. Uh, and here again is the summary of uh, the classification of stars and the Balmer lines, of course, the hydrogen lines are what they're classified d with, and it and it shows you and and what they what they look like via the hydrogen lines, the Balmer line, and again on the Chandra website and the stellar evolution module, there's an introduction to stellar evolution 
And that will give you um, an explanation, which is the most explanation that you will need. So you don't have to go to the purchase the CD ROM if you do not want to, though there is a lot of interesting information on that. Again, part two, uh, subpart three is on the Hubble classification of galaxies. And as we have said, it is a classification by morphology. There are normal spirals, and they are A, B, and C, according to how loosely wound their spiral arms are. There are also barred spirals that have a bar, odd bar, through the center of the galaxy. And again, it has spiral arms that are uh, tightly to loosely bound. So you have normal spirals, S, A, B, and C, and barred spirals, S, S, B, a, S, B, B, S, B, C, for the subclassifications of the tightness of the spirals. Uh, there are the uh, ellipticals, which have uh, a little gas and dust, old, some old population two stars uh, randomly wandering around in them. Um, they get more elliptical until you get a lenticular, which is mostly uh, elliptical, but has a little bit of structure in it. It's sort of a, a, a partway point. There's little star formation that takes place in ellipticals compared to spirals, of course. And we also have uh, the irregular. And irregular galaxies are sort of bipolar in nature. You have irregular galaxies that have no star formation going on whatsoever, or you have irregular uh, galaxies that have prodigious star formation going on within them. So, uh, and there are other types of, of morphology also, but these are the major ones. So part 2 IV is the multi-wavelength universe. Here we have the Antani and Sen A, and we see them in all different uh, types of, of, of electromagnetic uh, of the spectrum to give you an idea how differently they look because they're each showing a separate type of a process that's going on within that D sky object. As we know, some observatories like Chandra are way above the surface of the Earth, uh, collecting X-rays, because X-rays, fortunately for us, we wouldn't be here if they did, do not penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, all the way to radio telescopes that are ground-based, because um, radio waves can penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. And again, uh, we've talked about the HR diagram, we've talked about the temperature and the luminosity uh, we have not talked about the radius, but I'm sure that you have gotten that understanding as we've gone along. If you look at the main sequence, you have the dwarf stars with a very small radius. They are dim and cool at the lower right-hand corner as the main sequence process, process, processes up to the upper left-hand corner. Um, you can see that the radius gets larger and larger and larger because you have more and more and more massive stars. If you look at the white dwarf branch, those are white dwarfs, very, very compact uh, with strong gravitational field objects. Um, they have very little radius because um, uh, they're just a stellar core left behind. And you can see the giant branch has a larger radius. A supergiant branch has an even larger radius. And the cooler they get and the more extended their atmospheres get, then the, the greater their radius becomes. The distance modulus, again, is um, just a relationship between big M, which is the absolute intrinsic value, the absolute brightness of a star, little m, which is the apparent magnitude of the star, that's how bright it appears to be from us here on Earth, and r, which is distance. So if you know any two of those three var variables, the intrinsic and apparent brightness, and the distance, you can, you can calculate the other one. And all these deep sky objects, the stars, the galaxies, follow the inverse square law, where their luminosity or the power they radiate uh, is equal to the reciprocal of the square of their distance. Here are two, another example of an HR diagram showing the luminosity classes and the spectral classes and the temperature all together. Here is another one uh, that I like really well. I like this one, and, and you will see that the stars that, you're, that you need to know um, as part of the event description this year are plotted on these HR diagrams. You can actually see them. 
And right up here at the top of the main sequence, it actually plots Zeta or Fuchai. So on the Chandra website, again, for resources, there's this webinar. Uh, there's also another webinar that was posted up there a little bit ago that is called Stellar Evolution. Um, 101, it's Stellar Evolution for Science Olympiad Coaches and Teams. And um, it explains the process of stellar evolution. Um, and it, 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 this one is based upon the astronomy deep sky objects for 2018. And it talks about the stellar evolution, the HR diagram, how those uh, objects fit uh, in, in that process, and even the light curves, um, specific light curves for, for the different types of transition in the instability regions. As you move through the HR diagram, uh, resources, APOD, the uh, APOD uh, NASA website is a great one to, to accumulate images for, to study in all different wavelengths. Uh, and again, going to the missions themselves, their websites, for the most accurate information. There's a lot of inaccurate information out there, outdated information, just simply wrong uh, or dated. Uh, confusing, conflicting, it uses different terminology. So all of these websites uh, keep and the Chandra website uh, maintain the same terminology for the same types of processes. And the uh, National Science Olympiad store uh, has um, carries a CD-ROMs that um, one is the astronomy one I've mentioned, but they have other ones that are also contain some of this information. The Cool Cosmos website was developed by the IPAC mission, Spitzer. Uh, it has a beautiful set of information on the multi-wavelength universe. On the Chandra website, under our electromagnetic radiation module, we have an actual activity based upon uh, using the Cool Cosmos website. Uh, here, an example of three of this year's deep sky objects in all different wavelengths that's on the on the website and explains the processes that form those. On the National Science Olympiad website, every year they take all of the events and answer keys that that were uh, written and they put them on a CD-ROM and they sell them. So if you do not have, uh, but you purchase the National Science Olympiad 2016, um, Ma, um, the CD-ROM, the one from 2016, that was the last time we had Reach for the Stars. So there are, there's a test on that. 2015 and 2016 um, have the test from nationals for that year. That will give you a great sample of what the test is going to look like. And it shows you all the different kinds of star constellations and charts and graphs that, that can be used to identify for Section 1. Uh, these are sample pages from that test that gives you a really good idea of what the test is going to look like. So what you need to do, number one, if you have any questions about the event, uh, do not ask an event supervisor because we're not allowed uh, to answer a question because we might give a different, slightly different answer or different interpretation. And we want all teams to you know, be on the same footing, so to speak. So if you have a question about the event description, uh, please go to the NSO event uh, clarification website and uh, ask your question there. And then they'll ask us for the answer and then they will post the question and the answer. So if some other team comes along with that same question, all they have to look do is look at that menu and they'll see their question has already been asked and answered. So read the event description, know what you're allowed for resources to bring in, uh, use the webinars as a general introduction and overview of what the focus is or the intent is for the focus of the 2002 competition. Uh, use the astronomy guide um, if you purchase that. Uh, if not, definitely a lot of those materials are on the Chandra website. Uh, again, the 2016 and 17 sample test. Um, will will be greatly helpful. Now, um, for some reason, when they post uh, the resource materials on, on the website, it's posted under Event Supervisor and then under the event. 
So go to Event Supervisor and then look for your event, Reach for the Stars, and that's where things will be posted. Now, for this competition year, they posted a sample state test for solar system that was just an event this year. Um, what we're going to do this upcoming year, we are going to, because some of the invitationals and regionals are very, very early. They start in like November. So we are going to take a couple of the tests from the very beginning, and we're going to post those uh, on the NSO website. So you will have much earlier than usual, you will have multiple tests to use as sample tests to study from. Bear in mind, every test is written, uh, well, not our test, the ones that we're posting are going to be ones that are written by us, by the, the, the Science Olympiad alumni team that, that I have working with me that have all been highly successful in competing in the space science events uh, through the years, and they've meddled at nationals, many of them. Uh, we are, we're right, the tests that we write, we are going to post. And then you'll have a huge variety to, to choose from instead of just one. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, thank you very much for your time. And please let us know if there's anything that we can do to provide you with resources that you think would be more helpful for you that we haven't provided yet. Thank you.